make us and you know us better than we know ourselves, O Lord. Open our eyes that we may see you, see your spirit in your written word, see your spirit in the lives of others, see beyond the physical to the heart of the matter, that your mercy and love may touch our very soul, that we might respond in gratitude. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout. Look, here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, No, there will not be enough for you and for us. You better go to the dealers and buy some for yourself. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, Truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I had a dream earlier this week, and it was all about not being prepared for this very moment that we are living right now. It was this Sunday morning and this scripture passage. Worship had already started. All was going well, and it was time for the sermon only it was right then and there that I realized I was not prepared. I did not have a sermon. Now part of this may have been because earlier in the week I was not quite prepared for Bible study on this very same passage. But anyway, in my dream, I stood up and in good reformed tradition, the pulpit was in the center of the chancel area. And I prayed a quick little prayer, come Holy Spirit, come and help me. And then I thought, I'll start with a little review of what our who questions have been, praying that this would get my juices flowing. I remembered the first two, who is the greatest? And who do you need to forgive? But I couldn't remember any others. So... I left the pulpit, ran down the aisle, out to the bulletin board so I could look on the bulletin board to see what all the who questions were. <laughs> but wait, it gets even better. Bill Hoyle, the pastor at Clemens Presbyterian Church, jumped on the piano and started playing, keep your lamps trimmed and burning, keep your lamps trimmed and burning. Mm. All the while, I'm looking out of the board trying to see what the other who questions are. I returned to the sanctuary, and everyone was singing. And that's about all I remember. <laughs> it was a silly dream, but I woke up with a very anxious feeling of not being prepared. And very thankful that it was just a dream. 
And maybe some of that anxiety is about an actual wedding that is about to take place. <laughs> oh, in what? Six days, seven days? So, let's take a look at the parable and what this seems to be saying about being prepared, keeping alert. I have to tell you, I don't like this parable. There are lots of things in it that don't make sense. They don't fit with Jesus' message. And we don't have enough time to dig into all of that. But if you are interested, come Tuesday night or Wednesday morning to our Bible study, and we'll be digging in to this parable and to next week's. So weddings. We are very familiar with our wedding customs. Think of the service, the groom and the preacher up front, the bride escorted in, the exchange of the formal vows and promises, and the celebration following. We know that. We know what to expect. But in Jewish antiquity, it was quite different. You see, the formal vows and promises were actually made at the engagement. So the wedding was not really a service at all. There was no exchanging of vows at the wedding. Instead, the bride would wait in her home for the groom to come and get her, and there would be a processional from the bride's house to the groom's house. The relationship had already been formalized. The promises had already been made. Now they were going to take on a common life together. Only in this parable, the groom is delayed. Where is the groom? And what does it mean to wait? I think this really speaks to us today as we live in the in-between times, in between the resurrection of Christ and his coming again. We are already recipients. We have already received God's promises to us, and we are waiting for the moment of Christ coming and us living in the presence of Christ. So how do we live in these in-between times when the promises have been made, but that life is not yet here? We know sickness. We know brokenness. What do we do? How do we wait? How can we stay prepared? How can we keep alert when we get so distracted, bored, complacent, the tyranny of the ordinary, our Bible study lifted up. Things just keep going on and on and on and on. It seems that Easter will never get here. Thankfully, there are some things in our control, things that we can do to be prepared and keep alert. Christian fellowship, studying the word, being in prayer, several spiritual disciplines help us remember who we are and whose we are. Some commentaries have proposed that trimming the wick is equivalent to practicing these spiritual disciplines. And of course, in addition to having oil, keeping the wick trimmed is important because if you don't trim the wick, it'll get very smoky and it'll burn faster. So who is prepared? Are you? Are you prepared for the coming of the bridegroom? In the Old Testament, the people of God were often referred to as the bride and God the husband. In the New Testament, we find passages about the idea of Jesus being the bridegroom, returning for his bride, the church, and there being this wonderful wedding banquet. So what is this all about, five wise bridesmaids and five foolish bridesmaids. 
You remember the story we had a few weeks ago about the wise man and the foolish man? The wise man built his house upon the rock, and the foolish man built his house upon the sand. Do you remember what Jesus said about the wise man? He said, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So it seems that the wise man is wise because he hears God's word. But not only hears God's word, he puts them into practice. So maybe the wise bridesmaids are not only the ones who profess to be followers of Jesus, but they hear Jesus and they put into practice what Jesus says. They do good deeds, deeds done out of love, deeds done out of thankfulness and gratitude for all that Jesus has done and is doing for them. So they not only profess to be followers, but they have the good deeds to back it up. You know, by, your, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Good deeds. Something that the foolish cannot borrow from anyone else. They either have their own good deeds or they don't. And here they seem to be coming up short. Jesus had said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. So the foolish bridesmaids professed to be followers of Jesus, but they did not have the fruit or the good deeds that went along with the one who truly hears and puts into practice what Jesus says. Good deeds of mercy, abstaining from bad behavior, loving one's enemies, loving fellow Christians, forgiving others, walking by faith, being loyal to Jesus, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So that's a fairly accepted interpretation of this parable. But like I said, it's not a neatly packaged parable. Why don't the wise bridesmaids share their oil? That would be a Jesus thing to do. What if, though, the reason the foolish are foolish isn't because they didn't have extra oil, but because they left? Wouldn't the light from the other five have been enough for all of them? Wasn't the most important thing that the bridegroom was coming? Elizabeth Johnson, professor of theology from Luther Institute, says, What then is the problem of the foolish bridesmaids? Perhaps it's not even their poor planning, that is, their failure to bring extra oil. Perhaps their problem, problem is rather that at the critical moment when they were to welcome the bridegroom, they had abandoned their posts. They were foolish because they acted as if their primary job was to have oil in their lamps when this was only a means to an end. Their primary job was to welcome the bridegroom and accompany the bridal party with joy. But because they were distracted with secondary concerns, they missed the bridegroom's arrival, and they missed out on the party. Who is prepared? What does being prepared look like? Does it mean you have everything you will ever need for any possible situation? Remember, Warner? I don't think so. But perhaps it does mean staying in the game, being present, remembering who you are and to whom you belong. Not being anxious because you're not ready, but trusting that God will give you what you need. 
as long as there are people who need to hear the gospel, as long as there are hungry people that need to be fed, strangers that need to be welcomed, sick people to take care of, all kinds of people in need of a visit. We, my friends, have plenty of work to do until Jesus returns. And it's not that we are saved by our works. Rather, what occupies us, what we spend our time doing, is a sign of where our heart is, what our priorities are. This parable of the bridesmaid serves as a call to self-examination. Are our priorities aligned with God's priorities? Or are we so distracted with secondary concerns that we risk missing what is most important, the presence of Jesus in our midst? Being Jesus in the world being anxious for nothing. May we keep our lamps trimmed and burning. Amen. Friends, as we pray.